Welcome to Urban Fantasy PH. We are creatives who live in an urban society and give readers wish fulfillment by way of our stories, which is fantasy, but reflective of reality. Here, we get to talk to fellow creatives like writers, authors, artists, comic book creators, filmmakers, you name it. We create and share our art here in the Philippines, as well as abroad. My name is CJ Edmonds, I'm your host, and here is today's episode. All right. Good morning, fellow bookworms, book hoarders, book lovers, and creatives. Top of the morning to you all, and we are back for another episode, just in time for uh, Halloween season, or the season where not only things go bump in the night, but hopefully also when answers and perhaps even personal enlightenment uh, present themselves in the uh, or from the most unlikely of places. This is episode 29 of the podcast, and like always, during an ongoing season, our show is aired every Wednesday, both for Spotify as well as on my YouTube channel. You have the option to listen or to watch this, the choice, we leave it up to you. And whether you're listening or watching, please click the subscribe button so, uh, and ring the bell so you do not miss a single episode. And all of our past episodes are ready for you to return to or listen to chronologically, if in case you're joining us for the first time. Now, uh, man has always looked to the stars to make out and perhaps even define the conditions of their lives in the hopes that once they follow it, things can be made good or even better. Some people choose to follow it, while others believe that they alone should carve their path for them. Today's guest is someone who does exactly that. Now, you may have seen him on TV or online and perhaps even enrolled in one of his courses in the past. He is a professional tarot reader teacher, founder, and consultant at the Mysterium Philippines Learning Center. This is one of the first independent and contemporary intuitive training center in the Philippines. Now, being a teacher, he has also instructed more than dozens of classes in the field of intuitive development and the tarot since uh, 2006. He is the author of four books on spirituality, enlightenment, and of course, the tarot, with the fourth one coming out pretty soon which is entitled Tarot, 78 Spells for 78 Days. It is my honor and my pleasure to welcome onto the show the master and my friend, Mr. Robert Rubin. Hello, Robert. Hey, guys. Nice to see you again, brother. Nice to see you, too. Welcome to Urban Fantasy PH. Um, First things first, congrats on the upcoming release of the latest book. I'm sure you're very proud of the work. And and the time that you put into that book, and and you always bring in your A-game when it comes to that. Now, for, um, for those who are curious and who may have not heard of what you do, can you, in a way, introduce yourself and perhaps tell us something that I may have not covered in the intro? <laughs> well, um, believe it or not, people like to call me the modern-day Harry Dresden here in the Philippines because I take topics that are obscure and I make them understandable by people. Now, one topic that we haven't touched on yet is also... Uh, manifestation is something I'm helping people work with nowadays, uh, especially mm-hmm. with basic principles of magic and other practices as well. But primarily, I am a tarot consultant, tarot teacher, community leader, um, doxy lover, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I have a little dog here. And of course, proud father of two. So um, that's pretty much what I do. I spend most of my time with the people in the Mysterium community. And we're all guns blazing, prepping for the first ever tarot con here in the Philippines. Yeah, that's uh, that's happening this week already. But more on uh, Terracon a little while later on. But I've, as I said, this is uh, going to be your fourth book. The first one being Defensive Occultism. That's the first book, and mm-hmm. which I have it here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, there's, there's also Manifest, Practical Manifestation for Beginners, and the Intuitive being the third, which I got to attend your launch. I was wondering, will you have a similar book launch for the Tarot book? Yeah, actually, um, Tarot, 78 Spells and 78 Days will be launched during TarotCon at TarotCon All right. itself. Nice. Um, nice. Wave of that. Um, it's a very novel approach of how I prepared that book, and um, I'm excited for how it turned out. It's going to be my first ever fully colored book. Uh, so, of course, printing was a little bit expensive, but it was worth it because it looks really great. I got the demo copy. I'm really looking forward to getting the bulk orders in the next couple of days so that, you know, um, I can already have them prepared and autographed for people's starting in preparation for Saturday. That's right. Um, at least you get 
you know, a little bit of the uh, the head start for for signing those books. And you you want you don't want to be caught, you know, just signing all the way throughout the entire day and not speaking exactly. to people. <laughs> uh, being a professional tarot teacher, it may not be the first professional job that one may choose after college. But could you take us back when you first got introduced to the tarot? And sure. what was it about it that drew you in and kept you going and doing it for over 20 years? Well, to be totally honest with you, it wasn't my first love. Um, it was just something that I felt I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And I didn't look for it. It found me. I used to live in the San Francisco uh, area. And um, back in the early 90s, there was a lot of occult bookstores that you could go to there. And one of the ones that I would frequent would be the one called The Psychic Eye. But I was around 14 years old. I would go to this bookstore on and out just to, to browse because for people who don't know, 14 years old is kind of like the no man's land of people out there because you, you're too young to work, but you're old enough that your parents don't want to give you money. So you're just kind of like floating around, you know, trying to get freebies yeah. everywhere you can. So yeah. I'd go to the bookstore, I'd look at the books until they'd ask me to leave and I'd come back a couple of days later. And one day I went there and there was like a chung gate going on. Like these people were offering services, they had tables, they were doing readings. I was like, oh, this is so cool. And I approached one of them, who's this tall, Eastern European-looking guy. He had, like, white, curly hair and a beard. And I said, uh, sir, are those the tarot cards? Yes, I called it tarot back then. He said, oh, don't you mean tarot? I was like, yes, oh, yeah, the tarot card. Yes, are those the tarot cards? He said, well, yes, why do you ask? And I said, I don't know. Well, could you teach me how to do that? And he gave me a funny look. And he grabbed something from under his table, and he handed it to me. And there was a deck, and I was like, thank you, but I, I can't afford this. I don't have any money. He said, oh, no, no, it's yours. You can have it. I was like, oh, wow. Whoa, awesome. How generous. How generous. How generous. And then he said, ah, that's your journey. Now, excuse me. Now I have to read for someone. So I crept out of there, and that's how the tarot entered my life at 14. Wow, wow. That is that, what, a, what a profound way of being introduced uh, to something like that. And when um, – did you ever – you know, still get in touch with that person who gave you those cards? Never saw him again. I didn't, I didn't even get his name. Wow. wow. Because at that moment, I was so hell-bent on getting out of the shop because I thought that if the shop saw me get a deck from him, they'd charge me for it. So I was like, technically, he gave this to me, so I'm going to creep out of here before they say, hey, you got to pay for that. So <laughs> like, I guess you're a scavenger when you're 14 years old. Right, that's a that, that's a that's a smart move. <laughs> smart, smart. Uh, when one hears the word tarot, yes, children, it is silent T. Please do not pronounce or enunciate the T at the end. The impression that most people get is that this is the end all and be all of their quest. That they are getting the final answers to their life questions. But what they may not be aware is that the tarot actually presents you know choices, not just black and white um, answers. I was wondering, what do you think the impression of that has lasted the longest for most and probably one that has defined what tarot is for most people? Well, I, do, I, I don't fully agree that nowadays people think it's the be-all and end-all um, mm -hmm. because if that's the way you think, you're setting yourself up for getting burnt. All right? okay. I tell people that I'm very adamant when I tell people with the tarot that no reading is ever set in stone, that you mm -hmm. can change the outcome of any reading. Like, for example, <laughs> if I told you, Kaz, Okay, the tarot says it. It's set in stone. No matter what you do, you're going to go to the casino tomorrow and you're going to burn all of your money and your life savings. No matter what, it's set in stone. Where do you think you're not going to go tomorrow? You see what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it shows yeah, that yeah. the choice is completely up to you. And I tell my clients time and time again that any reader who's trying to tell you that something is set in stone, that merits a red flag. The point mm -hmm. of a true tarot consultant is to give you clarity and give you empowerment, but never to like force feed something to you. And if you're of the belief that this is going to tell you the end goal, we'll also be the, be the first to tell you there have been financial analysts who've been wrong. There have been doctors who've been wrong. There are lawyers who've been wrong. So right. the, the, the tarot can make the same mistakes as well. It's important to know that there's no such thing as an absolutely correct answer. Okay. All right. So you heard it here. <laughs> there's absolutely no correct answer. And, and, and you best really are the, the judge of how you want to approach that answer once you get it, right? I mean, some people may, some people will just, you know, hear one answer here and it'll just come out the other and they just, you know, forget the whole thing even after the session. And exactly. then they blame the session and the person who organized it and saying that 
it didn't work out the way I wanted to. Why? Because, you know, you, you didn't hear the advice or the suggestion. that was. Can presented. I share with you one funny story about that, Cass? Sure. sure. Back in the heyday, when I li still lived in the province, although I won't mention which province it was, there was a lady. She oh. was dating this dude for 14 years. 14 okay. long years, okay? I mean, that's longer than I was married. And um, they're about to get married, her and her boyfriend. So she asked oh. me, so how's it going to turn off between me and, let's just say, Steve? And I looked at the cards and I said, you know, it looks pretty good. You know, you guys are going to have a happy life together. You and Steve, you're going to have your long marriage. Congratulations in advance. I'm happy for you. Now, what did this girl do? She took that as God's law and she mm -hmm. decided to fool around before she got married. Oh, no. Oh, no. But you know what happened? She, she got, got caught pregnant. and the wedding was called off. And then she saw me like a couple of months later and said, you know, you're full of crap. You told me that it was going to be okay between me and Steve. We we're going to last a long time. Yeah, I did. But you decided to make an alternate reality by fooling around. That was on you. You see what I mean? Yeah. That's not on you. You chose that. Right, right. That's right. That's so right. it shows that the power is really in your hands. We just show you trajectory. At the end of the day, the end goal is completely up to you. Exactly. Now, for those who want to know more about, let's say, the cards, uh, the, th these cards actually began in Europe and as mm -hmm. well as in Italy. Um, specifically, they began as playing cards. There are different versions of it. You know, there's the French, they've got their own. There's a, the German. And the most popular one, and the one that's used widely, is the Rider Waite deck. And, um, I mean, I, I got my own deck right here. So, hello. So, there you go. It's the Rider Waite deck. Um, I was wondering, can you give our viewers and listeners how that particular deck came to be the more widely known and accepted? Okay, deck? now, again, I'm just going to educate your listeners. We call it politically the Ryder White Smith deck. Why? Because okay. Ryder was the publisher, Waite was the conceptualizer, but Smith, Pamela Coleman Smith, was the mm -hmm. artist behind it. So let's not. Ah, okay. It, okay. Now, the thing about it is this. The Ryder White Smith deck got prominence because that was created as a pet project of people of the of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and that well, was a very popular magical society of the turn of the century, early 1900s. So when they created this deck, A.E. White had his own pull in um, in the magical society. They kind of agreed that this was the deck that we were going to use, and what was nice about it was when he conceptualized each card with Pamela Coleman Smith. He turned it into what I like to call a descriptive deck, which means if you look carefully in the cards, the cards can and will describe the meaning of the card within the card itself. Oh. Unlike decks like the Marseille, where you'd be like, what the hell am I looking at here? You see what I mean? So yeah, that uh, the, the pull that it had by being published by the, or promulgated within the Golden Dawn and the simplicity of it to be used, made it probably the most popular, if not the most popular, tarot deck in existence. All right. Uh, moving forward. So if you are to address the deck, uh, would it be properly say, properly, proper to say that it's the Ryder Wade Smith deck and not leave yeah. Smith out of it? Yeah, please do, because she's the one who did all the artwork. All right. So moving forward, I shall do that. So it's going to be the Ryder Wade Smith uh, deck. And um, prior to being the master of the that you are, and like most of us, you, you also began as a reader. I was wondering what kind of books did you read when you were growing up? Wow. Well, you know what? This is a funny thing to tell, with you, tell you. I never formally took any courses or really followed any educational modules for tarot. Okay. I was school of hard knocks. I was just reading ah. for people. I was the old school. I started as the old school guy with the manual, the, the little white book, we call it, in the deck. And then you understand the definitions from there. And then you just keep reading and reading until it becomes second nature. Then you find your own approach of doing it. Okay. Um, but aside from that, other books that have had a very profound effect. Of, well, as I, got, as I got more into it, though, I got to say that our keynote speaker at TarotCon, Marcus Katz, really epitomized what I wanted to know in, about the tarot. He took it to the next level with his book, Tarosophy. Uh, so if you're talking about the tarot, I'd always tell people to go there. Um, there are a lot of other readers, uh, other people like Mary Greer, who wrote the Tarot Mirrors or Tarot for the Self. Those are good books for like self-discovery of the tarot. Or um, Miss Pollack, who wrote um, 78 Degrees of Wisdom. But this is already for you personalizing your experience with the tarot. Um, Tarot has always just been a tool of connecting to people for me. 
Um, I focused more on educating myself from the magical side of things. So works of like Franz Barden or Lon Milo Duquette or let's say um, Scott Michael Stenwick and several of my guests from Magic.TV are all people who um, influenced my practice moving forward. All right. Uh, would those books that you mentioned be available to buy or on, on TarotCon? In TarotCon, if I'm not mistaken, we will be selling some okay. of Marcus Katz's books like Tarosophy. Um, and his deck is also going to be available for sale, The Tarot of the Everlasting Day. It's a very, very beautiful deck. It's in a beautiful tin. He actually ma mailed me 10 copies of it, and wow. some of them are sold already. So we're going to be selling those. If you have an opportunity to buy these books have them and these decks, have them autographed, have a pictorial with him if you purchase. It's a very exciting time for all of us. Nice, nice. Um, since we're talking extensively about TarotCon, um, I assume that uh, we can sort of like move to that towards that. Sure. Uh, this is the first TarotCon ever, right? First, no, no. First TarotCon in the Philippines. Okay, in the Philippines. Yeah, right. That's right. In the Philippines. I stand corrected. Um, with all that, uh, you know, growing uh, curiosity, I guess, with regards to the tarot, um, the journey to mount an event such as this one, I'm sure, has been quite an education for everybody involved. <laughs> I was wondering, um, why do you think it took so long for the event to, to happen? Or do you feel that it was really just meant to happen this year and not in, in, in the time before that. I believe in the providence of it, that it was really meant to happen this year more mm -hmm. than anything. Because if you really look at it, Kaz, I mean, you're of the old guard. The community locally wasn't ready for something like this in the past. Yeah. Okay? In other words, even, like you, you're, you were the old school Wicca days. You know what it was like. Yeah. Um, even that couldn't get it together back then. What now? What more now? But with the boom of tarot readers that happened during the pandemic, mm -hmm. it really kind of just brought to the forefront that hey, there's a demand for this, and it's better that we get our acts together and w that we kind of like formalize the presence of tarot in the Philippines so that it goes in the proper direction. Because yeah. when when I was kind of given my epiphany moment. Of to do this because like I kind of got people call me weird but I kind of got, got a message from the universe saying you're going to do the tarot con the first ever tarot con in the Philippines and I'm like what the fuck I don't want sorry sorry for the F-bomb but I, <laughs> I, I don't want to do that I mean like I'm so lazy of doing stuff like that why why me and the spirits basically just said because if you don't do it somebody else is going to do it and it's not going to be as good okay and I was like well valid point Valid point. Okay, it's, it's so not right, that's the degree that you that you envision it to be. If someone else exactly, it, so. and if it turned up, if it became half-assed, then what would have happened would have been they would have you know pushed the tarot back ten years. What right. we are trying to do right now with this convention is put it already into the mainstream, telling people that hey, it's not going anywhere. It's a beautiful sacred practice that helps people gain clarity and fulfillment in their lives and. It's in all walks of life. We're not going anywhere. Uh -huh. You know, it's kind of like a launch for the tarot in the Philippines. Yeah. And then I kind of knew this was going to happen when Marcos himself told me that he would gladly fly to the Philippines just to support it. So I'm like, okay. It seems oh, that's than I expect. That, that, is, that is awesome. Uh, where, where in the U.S. is Marcus based? No, Marcus is from the U.K. Oh, U.K. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, he's the founder of the Tarosophy Tarot Association. Um, and I've always been a, a loyal member of that organization because of their slogan, restoring the spiritual dignity of the tarot. And I'm just like, that's exactly what I want for the tarot. I want it to be treated with dignity and I want it to be looked at as something beautiful, not as something laughable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's so many, apart from the Rider Waite uh, Smith deck, there's so many other decks that are, that are out there. Um, I'm going to show you this one that I got. I've never really used this as much, but... It's always been there in my shelf. I don't. I don't know if you you have this, but this is more of a darker deck. Oh, that's cute. Vampires yeah, and Eternal Night Tarot. Yeah, that's cute. yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's unusual, <laughs> but um, I've yet to really, you know, sink my teeth into it. <laughs> well, really I like to tell people that you find a deck that you can resonate with, that that kind yeah. of expresses you as you are, not. Like a deck, like example, people have asked me, Rob, don't you think you should be using the Toth Tarot of Aleister Crowley? Quite oh. frankly, it's a, it's a wonderful deck, but I hate using it. 
It's not okay. a deck that I would pull out for readings. Um, right. Honestly, if I'm going to give somebody a quality reading, I'll be I'll be completely okay using the Rider White. Okay. Um, there's also different decks that I see that are being sold in in in, in stores now, <coughs> and um, there is a difference between tarot cards and oracle cards. I've got my yep. own. I've got you know the, the, the chakra, and this one I this this one I this one I like. Working yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, uh, for those who are you know not initiated into the whole thing, it, what are, what is the difference between a tarot card and an oracle card? Oh, that's a very good question. The tarot follows a system of 78 cards or 22 cards. In other words, if you are calling it a tarot deck, it will have at least 22 major arcana and 56 minor arcana. It will have its own representation of the four suits, and within the major arcana, each card in its own way will be represented. In other words, it's still within the system. An oracle deck, we can literally do the Polgi Kaz oracle and take 60 shots of your best looks <laughs> and just make it a deck. You know what I mean? All right. So I like to say that it's more eclectic, that oracle decks are good, but there's no real system behind it. And mm -hmm. it's still very... Um, it's something, if you ask me, that should be augmented into an already established tarot practice, mm -hmm. but never should be the substitute of. Like, you can't pick up an oracle deck and say, I do what you do, Rob. It's like, no, you do not. It's like this. Um, I, I happen to know you're a singer, right, Kaz? Yes, I am. Okay. I can't just say, well, I sing. No, you don't, Rob. You don't sing the way I sing because I've taken voice lessons. I understand octaves. I understand, you know, there's a certain system behind it versus me mm -hmm. just singing in the shower. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's similar with tarot and oracle decks where I like to say, oh, I'm not saying oracle decks are shit. There's some oracle decks out there like the 40 servants that are amazing. But I'm saying that these are perfect augmentations for the tarot, but never, never, ever replacements of it. Okay. Um, is there like I don't know a separate organization that governs oracle cards? You know, just like what you guys are doing. Um, no, I don't think there could ever be because, like I said, the whole vastness of it. Anything mm -hmm. because, like, the truth is this: oracle cards came to prominence more or less because of Dion Fort. Uh, no, um, not Doreen Virtue. Okay. okay, started off with angel cards. Remember those? Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Hay House started printing up the Wazoo, every single kind of um, Doreen Virtue deck. But she kind of did something that not too many people liked, which was she found Jesus, which is fine. You can find Jesus all you want. But then she started renouncing and even condemning all forms of oracle practice. Oh, no. And we were like, well, you don't need to go and do that. That's kind of dickish. You know, you could find Jesus all you want doesn't mean that the people you used to work with, the communities you built, you know, you could shit on now, for lack of a better word. So the yeah. Oracle cards became popular because of her, but she sold out and people just started creating their own Oracle decks. So now, like I said, Kaz, you could make an Oracle, you can make the, the, the toilet bowl Oracle. You could take pictures of 30 toilet bowls and say, okay, this is your Oracle card for today. There's no rules. Yeah. It's completely abstract. All right. Well, who knows? Down the line, maybe someone will just, you know, pull in the reins and say, okay, we have to standardize this and, 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 and see what the tarot uh, peeps are doing. Uh, we should follow their lead or something like that. I, I, don't I, know. I, I honestly <laughs> doubt that could be possible because anything goes with Oracle cards. At least with tarot, we're following a particular, you know, a particular or, approach to it. Because like right. even the Lenormand, the Lenormand is a powerful Oracle too, but it has a system behind it. You see what I mean? It's a systematized mm -hmm. oracle. Right. And if you don't have a system, uh, and if you try to govern something that, that does not have a system built in place, then, you know, it's all going to be falling down. Like exactly. House of cards that, uh, that has not been glued properly. Um, your first book was called Events of Occultism. And let me just yep. share it here again. And I remember you talked about it when we had you as a guest on Mellow Nights when I was still on the night shift. Uh, with Indy on uh, Mellow 47. For those who have not read it, um, can you tell us what the book uh, was all about? Well, during those days when I wrote it, there, I noticed that there was no real book for a defense against the dark arts manual yet. Right. So I wanted to make a book that could simply give you some answers. I wanted to be the first to do it. It's been copied. The concept has been copied by other people afterwards, but just some basics on from any walk of life on how to protect yourself. Right. We should have ghosts, curses, etc. 
We should have called you Professor Snape then. <laughs> well, yeah, we've been called that too as well. We would. <laughs> well, your third book, of which I also have a copy, which is called Intuitive Within. Let me uh, share yes. that again. Um, if defensive occultism reads like more of a manual, um, that book comes off lighter and more like a workbook that prompts the reader to be more introspective. Was that the vision when you first started writing Intuitive Yes, Within? I actually wanted to un unleash people's intuitive authenticity. Mm -hmm. In other words, the truest version of themselves and show to them that it's possible for them to live the life that they want and even earn from it if they just learn to celebrate that side of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting that you, that you mentioned that, celebrating the truth within, because my next question leads up to this one line that stood out for me from Intuitive Within, and it goes like, the truth in me honors the truth within you. And it, and it just stood out for me. It's, you know, slapped me in the face. But do you remember when you first wrote that line? And how come the line sounds like a bit of a wake-up call of sorts for some people? Well, I do remember when I wrote it, but I also yeah. think that the important thing about it is that if you are, if you are, in, in, if, okay, how do I say it like this? Who are usually the people who shit on and attack your truth? These are people who are not following their truths. You see what I mean? Okay. Versus if you had that level of self-awareness that I am comfortable and I am secure in my truth, mm -hmm. then I can honor that truth in you as well. As long as it's your truth, in other words, any kind of truth you have, it's yours. I can honor it as long as I honor it as well in me. You see what right. I mean? Right. But the minute, also, I start, mm -hmm. the minute I start going to try to change that truth, I'm already right. encroaching, and that's not cool. Right. It, it, it goes without saying that whatever works for me should not be stamped on what works for you and saying that my standard should be your <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and sadly, most of the... Uh, most of the, you know, the quarrels, the wars that we get are, are, are just stemmed from that. That when, 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 people starts, uh, when people start saying that what works for me should be the same thing that you should be doing, um, uh, that's, that's where the line um, should be drawn. Now, your I latest agree. is it. I, I, I go by that as well. Um, your latest is called the Tarot, seven, eight spells for seven, eight days. Uh, will it be sort of a workbook of sorts or probably a hybrid of book one and three, part manual and part workbook? I think, yeah, it's going to be a hybrid and it's actually a teaser for the upcoming course, a 40 week long, four zero week long course that I'm going to oh. be offering through distance learning. It's going to be um, available early 2024, where mm -hmm. every twice a week you'll be given a spell from the book, a video. Okay with a lot of my own personal takes on how to do it. And we will discuss it via Zoom once every two weeks. We'll have mm -hmm. an interactive uh, module to communicate with all the students, to ask them, how are you doing with this spell? Did it work for you? What's your take on it? In other words, this is a living book. In other words, where by taking that course, not only will you be doing the spells with my instruction and my guidance, but we'll also mm -hmm. see how we can personalize them for your own personal use. All right. Uh, has anyone asked you, or for those who are, again, for the uninitiated, why is it seven, eight days and not 30 days? Okay, because there are seven, eight cards in the deck. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so each card has its own particular spell. Okay, and one spell for a day will, will cover everything, the entire deck, literally. Mm -hmm. But of That's course, I wouldn't want to give the spell every day, so I stretched out the course for 40 weeks. So mm -hmm. that they get a two spells a week. They can, on Wednesday and on Sunday, they get a new spell. And then we discuss in the time in between. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Um, no no definite day yet on when the course is going to be rolling. It's opening January 2024. I'm just going to have to do the recordings okay. for the lessons. All right. Something to look forward to in, in the new year, that's for sure. But Definitely. Did, you ever, did you ever feel like, you know, while in between the release of your books that you would run out of ideas on what to write next. And, and I was wondering what inspired you to write this latest one. It was always on the list of things to do. I had this idea for quite some time, actually, but mm. I thought that the time was right to really, to really put it all together and release it with TarotCon. Um, mm -hmm. It was it's just like a double whammy that you're releasing a book and doing TarotCon at the same time. And Marcus is there. So it's like, wow, it's like trifecta. Um, but what I'm seeing here is that when it comes to writing books, I learned to stop stressing it, that when the mm -hmm. universe wants to squeeze a book out of me, it'll make it happen. 
in short, nothing will ever be an accident. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, people can pre-order the book as, as already done. And mm -hmm. is that pre-order still ongoing? Yes, and, it's still ongoing. And if you okay. purchase it early, you get a free Kizer spell and you get 20% off the course if you choose to take it in 2024. If you get it before TarotCon. All right. Uh, will it also be released in both hardcover and paperback? Um, it is in paperback already. The hardcover, okay. we have to determine if that's going to be something viable to do or not. Mm, all right. So it's the first on paperback. Okay. Yeah, first on paperback, um, but it's fully colored. All right. Uh, well, I, for one, will be, if it's going to be available, I would love the hardcover. It goes best on the shelves. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, it's like after the first run is done, we'll see if we have the budget for to do for that. Because like, unlike the other books, this one was a pretty penny to, to, to print because of it being in pure color. Yeah, I, 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 can I can imagine uh, how it's going to be like that. But uh, uh, for sure, you know, people are going to be getting this uh, once it is officially available. That I affirm and that I'm so sure about it. <laughs> I just hope I sell out of the first run quickly so that I can go to the second run already. All right. We shall be, we shall be visualizing that for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm also curious about everyone's writing process. I mean, some people are plotters, some are pantsers, uh, where you just write from the seat of your pants. While that process may apply to more to fiction, uh, it certainly also is applicable to nonfiction writers. And while not spoiling the, the viewers and listeners, is there like maybe a backstory journey about the latest book that you can share? Uh, with our listeners? Well, I was inspired to do this by my teacher, Jack Grail who okay. came up with this wonderful course, the PGM, the Papyrus Greek Magicae, 50 Rights oh. for 50 Nights. And basically that course is similar to what I'm planning to do, which is, um, uh, basically I took the idea from him, I'll be honest, but he gives a spell every week from the Greek Magical Papyri. And oh. he gives the, the, the it's basically it's exactly what I'm going to do. But my approach is just going to be using the tarot. It's like, well, how come we can't do the tarot the same way? So that's actually what inspired me to do it. And Jack Grail being such an amazing teacher really just brought that out of me. All right. Nice. Um, they also say that reading a book is, is a journey for the reader, but it's equally a journey in itself for the person who, who wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel that your approach in presenting what you've learned and what you've researched beginning from book one to book four, what do you think has that changed and what do you think has changed within you after book four? Wow. That's a good one. Actually, because the, I don't know if you got my, my third book, which was written in between book one and book two, okay? Because the first book was Defensive Occultism. Yes. Now, while I was in the province, I also laid out and I wrote all the details for my second book, uh, The Hermetic Compassion, but I never released it. So it was just floating. Okay. So my second book that I wrote after Defensive Occultism was The Intuitive Within. Then I was kind of on hiatus for a while and somebody kind of told me, release the Hermetic Compassion, it's done anyway. So mm -hmm. that was the third book. The fourth book, which is the Tarot for 78 Spells for 78 Days, I'd like to say I was a different person at all parts of my life. Like the first book, I was a nobody. I had nothing. Nobody took me seriously. I was mm -hmm. trying to make my name. Okay. And... The Hermetic Compassion was an augmentation to the idea of compassion within people. I did that. I finished that whole book in one night. I wrote that whole book in one night. Wow. Now, when it came to the, the second book of mine, The Intuitive Within, that was very kismetic because I actually, after the shortcoming of my first book, which was kind of dull, to be honest, I kind of said to myself, I'd never write again. Mm -hmm. But a student of mine told me about this wonderful book by an art, uh, a writer called Julia Cameron called The Artist's Way. And she said, if you're um, creatively blocked, if you do all the exercises in this book, on the 12th week, you will have a creative unleashing again. So mm -hmm. I gave it a try. And on the 11th week, I started writing that book. So I was like, okay, this shit works. <laughs> That's uh, that's the uh, the artist's way, Julia Cameron, yeah. right? Julia Cameron, amazing yeah. book if you're stuck. And of course, the recent book that I really, it kind of felt like giving birth. I swear to God, I felt like I was giving birth to a child. That I, because I, I, I did it in such a small amount of time, I had to have everything done before TarotCon. 
And yeah, I don't yeah. like to write like that. I like to write out of joy, but this was like, no, you got to do this many cards a day. If not, you're not going to make it. So like, came to the point, I was just lying down literally in between the chapters. I'm like, oh, wow. But it got done. Um, if it hadn't been for, for Tarakon, uh, do you think you would have finished this in, in the time that you did? <laughs> no, no, I would have taken my sweet time. Uh, oh, I would have taken know. my very sweet time. Well, you know, which is all, which is also okay. I mean, you know, to each his own uh, process. But it is really a good thing to have two things running at the same time. That you have the event and you have the book launch. Uh, you know, to to complement uh, the event uh, as well. Uh, so for those who are not aware of where Terracon is going to be, it is going to be held where again? Oh, uh, join Nostalgia Hotel in Ortigas this Saturday, October twenty eighth. From 2 to 9 p.m. All right, 2 to 9 p.m. And for those who are interested, where can they get tickets to go? Uh, they can go to the website tarocon.one. Okay, tarocon.one. All right, I will put that in the, uh, in the show notes so that uh, the people can also uh, uh, find out about it. Uh, I, I take it that there, there is also an online component. Now, for those people who are not able to go there physically, they would rather join uh, online. Is there a possibility of doing yeah, that? Yeah, there is an online version of the, of the show that you can listen to all the talks. And mm -hmm. the tickets are 1,500 pesos. So if you want to attend all seven talks, you can. Um, and okay. I think you get a recording with it too. So also at tarocon.one. All right. Same, same, uh, same site. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Um, after TarotCon and after the book is out, um, is there still anything else there in your plate that you want to quickly address? <laughs> or, or, yeah, or the next intro to the tarot certification. Yeah, the next intro to the tarot certification course at Mysterium Philippines op opens November twenty sixth. So, if you want to learn from the best readers in the Philippines, we welcome you to join. Check us out on facebookcom slash Philippines. Uh, how long would a course like that run? Uh, Six weeks every Sunday from six thirty PM to eight thirty PM. Okay, just on Sunday, not not, yeah, not just on Sunday. Sundays. Just on Sundays. So um, you can really make also, the time. Long. Is there also an online equivalent for that course? Yeah, there's there, there is. It's purely online, completely online. Okay, purely online. All right. I thought uh, that you have to be there, and uh, we call it hybrid because if enough students are local and they want to have an in-person class, so we can. But it's bare minimum online. Mm. Okay. Um, when you first designed the class and as compared to how the classes are going to be now moving forward, um, has anything changed since then? Did you... A lot. Know, now we are more community-based. Yeah, we're more community-based. You get mentors, you get a tribe. It's really more about bringing people together and building relationships through the practice of the tarot and intuition because mm -hmm. um, we're not a community with we're not a we're not just a community or a business we are a community with a business aspect to it okay i like that community with a business aspect yeah we gotta and, pay and, the bills, right exactly exactly and you and we live well to paraphrase madonna we live in a material world you need money you need moolah to buy the stuff yep. that you need <laughs> to get the the kind of deck that calls out to you and so where are you gonna get moolah if you don't you know, put in a little effort uh, into your business exactly yeah. Uh, for those who want to get copies of your uh, previous books, uh, I take it that they can get it directly from your website? Yeah, uh, robrubinreadings.com. That's the place to go. Okay. And once again, uh, the website to go to for uh, TarotCon, that would be uh, tarotcon. Dot uh, o -N dot dot o -N. one. Dot one. All right. We shall put that down there. Um, that's it. Uh, I don't want to take so much of your time uh, as well, Rob. You need all the energy that you you need. <laughs> uh, for I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you on Saturday, my friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah for this uh, coming uh, Saturday. Uh, for those who want to get to know more about you and and the courses, of course, we will list down the uh, the show notes in the show notes the website that they can go to. And you are also like on Instagram. You're also on Facebook. And mm -hmm. the best way to reach you would still be robrubinreadings.com. Uh, yep. All right. all right. So uh, thank you so much, Rob, for joining us today. I wish you all the best this coming Saturday for Terracon. May it be a smashing success. And with that success, for sure, lead on to Terracon number two. Yay, yay, yay. Thanks for the support. I'll see you there, my friend. Let's manifest that. 
All right. Amen. So uh, till the next episode, Indie Creatives Unite, keep creating and we shall keep reading for those who are thinking of uh, joining the courses and you feel that this might be a wake up call for you to look in more into the tarot, then let it be that because nothing really is an accident. And, and that's what we firmly believe. And uh, we wish you all the joy in manifesting all that you want in your life. So stay safe, stay creative, namaste, and blessed be. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Bye-bye. Good luck. Take care as well. That was another episode of Urban Fantasy PH. Join us next time as we feature another creative soul who wants their art to be seen, heard, and shared. If you have your own work to share, just email us at urbanfantasyph at gmail.com. Through the next episode, this is independent author, singer-songwriter, radio personality, voice actor, and fellow creative, CJ Edmonds, reminding you to always listen to your heart, create with your mind, and share your soul. Goodbye, everybody. Namaste. Blessed be.